It gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce our final keynote speaker of the day, John Ledecky. John's been so generous to, uh, to, to be willing to spend the time with us um, and give you some background. And some of you may recognize John. And if you took Michael Newman's sports sponsorship and sales course last, uh, last spring uh, and you were looking around the room during your final presentation about naming rights, uh, for the, uh, what is now going to be a, ultimately a, a reality, right, with groundbreaking occurring on the, um, on the new Islanders Arena by Belmont Park. Um, and you looked out and you saw the co-owner of the New York Islanders sitting, sitting there, um, and that actually uh, was, was an interesting one. We'll get into that in a moment. So uh, John's been a, a great friend of the program. Um, quick background uh, and bio on John. John Ledecky, co-owner of the New York Islanders, was born in New York City raised in Queens and Brooklyn, moved to Greenwich, Connecticut as a teenager where he attended Greenwich High School, where he wrote for the high school newspaper and was so good that he actually won the Grantland Rice Award for being the nation's top high school sports writer, uh, which would have earned him a four-year full, four-year scholarship to Vanderbilt University. However, based on his father's insistence that he attend an Ivy League school, uh, John then decided to attend the school up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, called Harvard University, um, continuing his reporting work at the Harvard Crimson um, and at the college station WHRB, earned his bachelor's degree there as well as his MBA, uh, which was then followed by a series of venture capital uh, type positions. Uh, including the last one of these was at Steelcase in 1994. Um, and, opened, and then John decided to open up his own company in the office supplies business, um, backed by a number of Harvard alums. Uh, a big roll-up occurs over a short period of time. Um, and the company becomes uh, known as, or is known as U.S. Office Products, which was founded in 1994, sold and taken uh, public, I'm sorry, taken public in 1998. Um, and the rest then becomes history on the business side, right, on the sports side in October 2014. Uh, John and his former high school friend, who he covered as a hockey player while he was a sports writer for the newspaper, the high school newspaper, Scott Malkin, enter into a deal together to purchase the New York Islanders. Um, they become minority owners during a two-year transition period before gaining majority control in 2016. Uh, and if you know and if you follow uh, the NHL, you know that the Islanders have been on very much an upward trajectory, uh, really, uh, since you've taken ownership, right? Um, which we'll get into and, and we'll talk about the really exciting stuff uh, off the ice now, but will we'll become on the ice going forward. Um, so I want to start with a question for you, John, and, and thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's a long one, but there's a lot to cover. You, you, you've, you've done some stuff, right? Yeah. So uh, the background on this is fascinating. So there, there's a story out there, at least, as, as urban legend has it, that about how you and, and your co-owner actually met. Right? And the story goes that you're walking your dog. You just moved right to Greenwich. You're walking your Basset Hound. Right? What was the Basset Hound's name? Fred. Fred. You're walking Fred. Fred. Yep. Um, and Fred's out for a walk, and, and you get rolled up on in a good way by someone who rolls down the window. This nice woman right? rolls down the window and introduces herself and says, I don't know you. Right? And it's Scott Malkin's mother. Yep, she said that she knew uh, every Basset this Hound true. owner in Greenwich and that she'd never seen me before. <laughs> and she asked me for my phone number. I wrote it down, and uh, I just moved from Bayside, Queens, where my mom had told me never talk to strangers. And um, so here I'm giving this strange woman who's talking about Basset Hounds my phone number, and it did turn out to be uh, Scott Malkin's mother, and I was invited to a party. And that kind of changed my life in a lot of ways because um, I had been uh, having a great time in Queens. My father got relocated. He was an immigrant. He started out as a dishwasher at a Howard Johnson's mm -hmm. on Exit 9 on the Jersey Pike. It's no longer called Howard Johnson's, but when you go to, down the Jersey Pike, you'll see that uh, rest station. And he went to school at night for 30 years. And uh, he finally got a job in Stanford. And so his boss lived in Greenwich and said, the commute's too far from Bayside. We love Bayside. Mm -hmm. Um, and the commute was too far, so it was the Beverly Hillbillies. I literally remember my mom coming into a room I shared with my brother and said, here's a brief, here's a suitcase. Whatever you can fit in the suitcase, you can take. The rest is going down the garbage chute. And uh, 
Yeah, unfortunately, I had a full collection of baseball cards, and uh. I didn't make the cut, so uh, could, have, could have done well on that. And but. so you leave Bayside, Queens, as the Islanders are moving into... As they're formed. Formed yeah. in 1972. Yeah. And I was a great Rangers fan. I had the radio under my pillow listening to Marv Albert, who is still announcing today, some 46 years later. I would listen to those Ranger games and Nick games, and I would pretend that I was Rod Gilbert or I was going to be Walt Frazier. Um, of course, none of those worked itself out, but, uh, but then we moved, to, uh, we moved to Connecticut. Yeah. So, you're a hockey fan, but big sports fan. It's been reported that you bid on a number of different teams, right? Um, you once pursued the Montreal Canadiens, right? But in other leagues, the Cincinnati Reds, the Dodgers, the A's, the Nationals. True? Yes, very true. And, and I think the, uh, the reason for that was clear. I, I, I very early in my career recognized that sports teams were great uh, community trusts, that they had a great standing in the community. If you wanted to do something to change a community, having a sports team gave you a platform second to none. I say to people, think about IBM and the amount of money that IBM or Procter & Gamble spends on advertising either their corporate brand or themselves. And then think about a sports team where every day, for free, you're in the newspaper, you're on TV, you are got your own games on TV, you're on the radio, you're now today you're on social and digital with millions of followers. You have a chance to make an impact. So if you wanted to do good for a community and put together an education program as a private citizen, maybe that gets attention for a nanosecond or a few tweets. But if you're the New York Islanders doing it and you're doing a fulsome program throughout the Long Island schools to teach STEM skills, you're getting attention for that every day and you're getting community support for that every day. And you have a platform and a group of players who are involved and engaged in the community. So that was one reason. The second reason was, and, and it's great to be right, but I never got any of those teams. I can remember Don, Garb, Don Garber was my uh, grade school classmate. He was my first grade classmate at, at PS 169 in Queens. And in 1999, he called up and said, John, Phil Anschutz wants to start selling. Phil Anschutz owned the majority of the soccer teams in MLS. He wants to start selling them. He'll sell you the team for $10 million. And I can remember having difficulty trying to find a partner mm -hmm. to buy a team for $10 million, and the last franchise went for what? $400, $500, $600 $1 million. And that's the other thing about sports that's so interesting as you pursue your careers. The 160 teams, if you include MLS, the four major leagues in MLS, those 160 teams are the equivalent of Van Gogh paintings. They're not making many more of them. They're not making any of them except for a franchise team. And every time there's a franchise sold on an expansion basis, it's going for a record price. So my theory back then, which has proved to be correct, is um, if you only have 160 sports teams and you have 200 plus billionaires being minted every year in the United States through technology, Facebook, Google, et cetera, the supply of sports teams and the demand for them will intersect. And I can remember having many conversations with one of my friends from college, Steve Ballmer, who was trying to buy a sports team for years and years. And his biggest problem was his wife did not want the children on television. And so he literally had to wait. This was a guy who wanted to own a sports team in the worst way. He literally had to wait till his eldest was in college, and then he got turned loose. And as we know, famously, he paid $2.1 billion for the uh, Clippers. So um, I think that's the case today. Uh, those teams you're talking about, I can remember Bud Selig calling me, the price on the Oakland A's was initially $155 million. Think about that, what that's worth today. Bud called me and said the owners, there were two owners at the time, they had a disagreement, um, and they wanted to raise the price to $170. And the folks that I was working with on that deal, and I see Eric Fisher here who was in the market and watching and following my exploits um, for the Washington Times. Eric. Uh, basically knows the story, Bud, Bud calls and says, John, you're 43 years old at the time, I was 43. Um, you're gonna own this team for the next 40 years of your life. What's $15 million? And I said, well, explain that to my investors. They think that's the top tick that will ever be paid for a baseball team in America. And I've heard that story throughout the last 15 to 18 years. Every time somebody buys a team, someone will call me and say, there will never be a team sold, for, like Steve Ballmer, there'll never be a basketball team sold for more than $2.1 billion. And Joe Sy from Alibaba steps up and pays $2.3 billion for the Nets and a $1 billion for Barclays Center. So it continues apace. Um, again, I think it's, it's following other uh, collectibles. Yeah, I mean, if this is a bubble, 
and bubbles burst, and this has been the longest lasting bubble perhaps in the history of the United States economy. So since 1960, the average sports team, the average, if you take all the sports teams and put it, the average return has been 13% compound for the entire 59 years. Every year, on average, that's what's occurred if you blend it all together. Yeah. That's remarkable, much better than the S&P, much better than all these other things. And, and the ownership of a team, very different than some of your other investments and other businesses that you've been involved in, obviously, yeah. right? So this is your fourth season uh, at the helm, sixth overall. Um, how do you define success for the Islanders? Is it in terms of championships or revenue or profit or growth of your fan base, a new building, player commitment, brand equity, growth of your brand globally, or is it something else? I think, well, first of all, we say that we've we won four rings in a row, four Stanley Cups in a row, and have had a long period since then. So our, our stated mission is the fifth ring. Okay. By the way, the first ring was as a growing up as a Philadelphia Flyer fan was my first sports cry. <laughs> right? I'm still unhappy with Bobby Nystrom and Leon Stickle, the linesman who missed he was offsides. <laughs> Two strides. John, go ahead. No problem. Right. So I, I think, I think uh, getting the fifth ring for the fans, understanding that the fans are our shareholders is incredibly important and having a culture that includes top people. So I want to point out Nicole Hogan, who's sitting right there. Nicole, stand up for a second. Nicole is with <laughs> us, but Nicole is a graduate of this program. And Nicole made a presentation for us when we were thinking about Belmont Arena. And we, the question was, what should the arena be named? And this is way before Joe Sai even showed up. She said, with her group, you, sh you should go after Alibaba and have it be Alibaba Arena. So it'll be interesting to see if it becomes that at Barclays or if Barclays keeps their name on it. But Nicole is in charge of our partnership activation. She's done a great job. I encourage all of you to see her um, afterwards. And my hidden reason for being here is I think that young people working in sports is amazing. The average age of our, of our group at Floral Park, Queens, uh, where we have our headquarters, is under 30. Mm. And uh, I'm here recruiting, right? I'm not here ringing my bell and talking about myself. I'm here to try to impress all of you, because I want you all to think about the New York Islanders as you think about your careers. Um, we're growing the business. We have a lot of things going on, obviously, with a new arena. So I hope that you'll track down Nicole. She is uh, the best asset we have as a recruiter at the New York Islanders. Thank mm. you, Nicole, for joining us and being such a great employee so far and partner. So, if that's not a ring, this is not a paid endorsement, by the way, of Columbia <laughs> University Sports Management Program. You better be careful. Nikki's going to start bugging you for a raise pretty soon. Um, so, three years ago, uh, you were quoted as saying, and I quote, we're passing through. We're the stewards. We're the trustees. When I go to heaven, I want to be remembered for doing everything I could to make us win on and off the ice. That he focused on that fan experience, and he made it a pleasure to come to an Islanders game. That's what I'd like to see as my legacy and Scott's legacy to the team, end quote. Is that still true? Very much so. I think uh, the, the whole Belmont Park uh, Arena experience taught us how important it is to be part of the community. So Belmont will create 12,000 jobs, uh, construction jobs and contracting jobs over the next three years. And then there'll be something like 3,500 permanent jobs in and around the Belmont Arena. Um, it was very important to Scott and I that our legacy be that. For Scott, who has four daughters, he, I think, one day wants his grandchildren driving by on the Cross Island Expressway and say, Granddad built that. And so we're not just plunking an arena at Belmont Park. We're transforming a 458-acre site into an arena, but then also a community that has a hotel and a retail village and parks and recreation and training centers and computer centers and things for the Elmont community which has been so underserved, and for the Floral Park community, which is adjacent to us, and Middle Village, and other places in Queens. Mm. So you were previously a limited partner of Ted Leonsis uh, in DC with the teams down there. What was that experience like? Well, that was in 1998 to 2001, and it was a spectacular experience because Ted was, and still is, an enormous visionary. So Ted said to me, John, I'm telling you what the future is. Imagine that you're gonna have a computer in your pocket. I go, what? Yeah, you're going to walk around with a computer in your pocket, and that computer is going to erase all forms of traditional media. In 20 years, this is 1998, in 20 years, 
No one in the millennial generation, or what the equivalent was at the time, no one in that generation will buy a newspaper. They'll be reading everything in this computer in their pocket. And by the way, it'll ring, and you'll be able to talk on it. And so Ted really had that vision ahead of time. He had bought a company called ICQ, which was an Israeli company, which was the first text messaging company on the planet. If you had AOL, you could text message other people on AOL. So that was fascinating. And then Ted predicted, really predicted the, the rise of technology because he had that perch at AOL. And I think the things he's done subsequently show such incredible insight, right? He's, a, he's been ahead of the game on digital social. He's been ahead of the game on gaming and gambling. He's just a visionary. He's a guy that has gone from back chair at the NHL when we first bought the, the team to now being on the executive committee and being one of the real confidants of Gary Bettman as Gary and the, and the league go through the process of understanding the next gen uh, technology. And, and now you compete with him, right? I mean, that, that's the, is that a strange thing that someone you so admire and uh, have a relationship with, but now your competitors or your teams are competitors. Yeah, I don't, I, you know, we are, yeah. but, but Ted is a best friend, right. right? And going to Ted's kid's wedding, and he, you know, very cheekily sits me next to uh, Ovechkin. That, that, was, <laughs> that was quite an evening. Right. Hear, Ovechkin's <laughs> on my right, and another guy uh, is on my left from the team, uh, Carlson, and they're great guys. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing about hockey players, yeah. right? They're, they're great guys, they can kid and rib, but they're really involved in their communities. Um, they really understand what the role of sports and athletics is. And so meeting players from other teams in that social dynamic was terrific. And I got to tell you, I was at the Stanley Cup when, when Ted won the Stanley yeah. Cup. And I cried because yeah. I was so happy for my friend. And yes, we now are fierce competitors, but we're also friends uh, off the ice. Mm. So you had an unusual two-year transition, right? That really, we, it's, I, I can't remember ever seeing anything like that before, before taking control of the franchise. So you, were, you bought in. Um, and then there was a two-year transition period before you became uh, the controlling ownership group. What was that like? I mean, in hindsight, was that a good thing? Yeah, it was fabulous. I think uh, Gary Bettman and Bill Daly, who's the uh, deputy commissioner of the NHL, <coughs> actually complimented Scott Malkin and Charles Wong mm -hmm. for doing it that way because um, you make so many mistakes as a rookie owner that you can never put back into the bottle. And if you have a transition, if it could be possible that all teams were transitioned from owner to owner, when you look at some of the teams where that's happened, they've had massive subsequent success because the person learned, right? So Bishotti in Baltimore with the Modell family, right. there was a transition and they won the Super Bowl, right? So we're hoping for the same type of thing to happen here. Uh, Charles Wong was a fabulous mentor. He's passed away, unfortunately, but he was a fabulous mentor to Scott and myself, a real visionary about Belmont, for example. But he said something to me that will never leave me, that's informed all sports ownership, really, if you think about it. He says, John, when you lose, you're allowed to mourn for 15 minutes, and then that's it. Because nothing you do or say will ever change the result, and you always have to look forward to another game. And I thought that was a great philosophy that he had. So he imbued us with his 15 years of ownership experience, the market in Long Island, who to meet, who to avoid who to do business with, who to go after for partnerships. It was a great relationship, and I highly recommend it to somebody. I think you're seeing that now. I think you're seeing LPs coming into deals as LPs first mm -hmm. before them buying the rest. So you look at a Michael Jordan who just added two very wealthy LPs. Is he planning a succession as he gets into his 50s? Is he thinking about what happens in 10 or 15 years? I want to get to know these guys. This is going to be part of my legacy. Yes, I think that's what's happening in sports, you're seeing these LP interests being sold in anticipation of uh, the deal passing from one generation to another. Interesting, I mean, going back on the LP, although you do have to know who the majority, who the controlling owner is, right? I mean, the, there's a, a great quote uh, for those of us who follow these things from John McMullen, who owned the New York Islanders, yes. but for a period of time also uh, was a, a, a minority New, investor. New Jersey Devils, yeah. And, I'm sorry, the New Jersey Devils. Um, and for a period of time was also a minority investor with the New York Yankees, who once infamously said, <laughs> right, there's nothing so limited as being a limited partner of George's, right? Um, so, so there is some of that. So you, you've become, a, you now have a public persona. You've become a, a public figure right, through the dint of ownership of the team. You were once a sports writer for the Harvard Crimson, obviously, while well, you were an undergraduate. How, it, if at all, has it impacted how you handle the media as the owner of the Islanders? Um, the thoughts yeah, on the media scrutiny question. that comes with ownership of an NHL franchise. Yeah. So I think, by definition, journalists are paid to not be cynical, but to be smart. 
And I think journalists also can spot a phony from a mile away. Mm. So one, you have to be genuine. Two, you have to follow through on what you're saying. It's great to stand up here and say, we're going to do this, that, and the other. Then if you don't follow through, it's a great quote, but there's no follow through. So I think there's a BS meter, if you will, that journalists like Eric are very in tune with. And they have to figure out where that person's coming from and are they actually going to walk the dance that they're talking about mm. doing. And I think that's the important thing. And I think as a former journalist, I had a great deal of skepticism about coaches or owners and stuff like that that I came across. But I wanted to give them the benefit of the doubt, and uh, that was important. Mm. So your high school buddy, college roommate turned co-owner, Scott Malkin, runs a global business. He's based in London. You are the face of ownership, right? Um, you seem to embrace this role, right? I mean, you, you know, you, you're being the public ownership face and being a, quote, owner of the people, right? And, quote, riding public transportation, sitting with the fans in the seating bowl, mingling with the fans in the concourse. We don't see that very often these days. Right. Does that bring with it any added pressure? No, it's a, it's a pure delight because I recognize <coughs> that our, our mascot is, is Sparky. Um, that's the name of our mascot, right? And I often say that I'm Sparky in a suit. <laughs> and, and by that I mean I'm the closest thing to the players that the fans love. I'm the personification in that moment in the, in the arena, in the bowl, walking around. They can't embrace and, and say hello and thank or, or talk to the player because the player is busy playing, mm. but they can talk to the owner. And I think, again, if you're accessible, what's, what's, what's selfishly the greatest thing I get out of that? I hear more feedback about what we're doing wrong, mm. right? Hey, they don't think about this. They go, hey, there's a, there's a bathroom toilet out in, in the lobby there, or hey, there's a bad uh, hot dog stand over there. The hot dogs are cold. You're getting instant feedback from your fans. And as we transition to a new arena, if I'm not walking the concourse and dealing with the customers, because again, the fans are the customers. The fans are the lifeblood of a sports team. If they're not having the time of their life, they're not coming back. Mm -hmm. There's so much competition for the entertainment dollar. So I want to hear that. I want to hear the negative. Of course, they're very nice and give me the positive as well. But I want to hear the negative stuff that's informing their experience. Did it take them 60 minutes to get out of the parking lot? I go to sporting events. It pisses me off if I have to wait 60 minutes to leave a parking lot, right? We've all been there. How do we improve that? When we go to Belmont, how do we make the road flow better? Well, one of the ways of doing that is have something after the game for people to do. Younger people may not have to rush back on a weekday night. They might want to have some additional entertainment. What can we do, right? Millennials are, are, are taking in sports differently. Why don't we have a millennial area? Why don't we rip out the seats and let the millennials stand and the Gen Z stand and get to know each other? It's a party for them. They're, they're, it's part of their life. Oh my God, somebody just scored. Well, listen, we should go to that musical thing. The next, right? They want to meet and introduce, want to have those person-to-person -person experiences that you can't have online through a match.com. We should be sensitive to that and understanding that as we build the arena of the future. Mm -hmm. What have some of the biggest challenges been? You've had a lot of successes, but what have some of the biggest challenges been um, thus far in ownership? I, well, I think the biggest challenges we had in the beginning was trying to learn how to manage a sports organization. So we came in, and Charles Wong, in moving the team to Brooklyn, had given all the operations to Brooklyn Sports and Entertainment. So the frustration there was you obviously were a tenant in someone's building, and you also didn't have control of your brand. Charles literally sold the brand as part of the deal to Brooklyn Sports and Entertainment. So that was a real challenge. The challenge on the reverse side is that relationship ended as we got our Belmont situation together. Mm -hmm. Now, as I've said, and I'm not kidding, we have to hire hundreds of people, right? We need hundreds of, of great Nicoles. That's not such an easy task. You gotta find the right people to grow a sports organization professionally. So we, we talk about this, and, and so we're talking about hiring, um, you've made two huge hires on the hockey side of the equation. I know you're not involved in the hockey side. Uh, you're not the GM, right? The GM nope. is the GM. Um, but you've hired two big names with Stanley Cup pedigrees as the president and GM and Lou Lamorello and a head coach, Barry Trotz, coming off of a cup-winning season with the Capitals. Can you describe that process and what you were looking for and what you were, you know, you talk about hiring students, but when you were hiring the front office staff and what you were looking for from that, those hires? Right. It was, it was really a return to excellence. And we got super lucky because um, two of the iconic people in the hockey world fell in our lap. Lou Lamorello, 
who won three Stanley Cups in New Jersey and was in Toronto and his contract was coming to a pause where he could decide to come back to the States. Mm -hmm. And then Barry Trotz, who basically was having trouble after winning the Stanley Cup, getting to a new agreement. And I think that uh, the folks at the Caps, again, who I know very well, decided to go in a different direction. So we got lucky twice and they have changed the on ice culture. The locker room has never been tighter. Um, the players play for each other. There's a brotherhood in the room and uh, it makes a big difference. Mm. So. Hey, can we open it up to questions? Yeah, I don't, we got I, I, left. Yeah. Absolutely, we've minutes? got five minutes left, That's so we'll okay. open it up. Um, I want to, as you talk about building the organization as the mics work their way around the room, you've been quoted as saying no detail can be left unattended to, uh, unattended to build a world-class organization. Right. How do you execute the details? Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, it's an 18-hour day, and like I said, the day starts with trying to figure out how to drive revenue for the team to make it more successful, and it ends literally calling my chief of staff and saying there's a plug toilet you know on level two mm. um and and again that plug toilet on level two getting to the level of ownership shows a commitment number one but number two it says we care mm. so we care about the product on the ice but if we don't care about the fans showing up and they've had a bad experience or they can't they so for example at belmont one of the things that we're very pleased to have done with the architects is based on feedback 45% of NHL, for us, 45% of our fans are women. Mm. Have you ever seen the line to use the women's bathroom in between periods? It's ridiculous, right? So we decided we're going to be the first arena to have more women's bathrooms than men's bathrooms at a sporting event. It makes business sense, but it also makes sense for our fan base, right? So it's thinking about those little details mm -hmm. and coming up with solutions. Yes, it'll cost more to do that because you can't cut the number of men's bathrooms, right. but you should have more bathrooms because you got that 20 minute break, or if it's a concert, you got that little time out maybe in the middle. People have needs, you have to fill those needs, whether they're that small or that big. Mm. Uh, audience questions? Sure, go ahead. Um, I asked this question earlier to the previous panel, and I want to ask the same one now, because you, are, you have a much different perspective as the owner of the franchise, but I'll just take the data component out of it. How do we ensure that franchises are making the most of their tangible assets, like their <coughs> merchandise, their seats, their stadiums, and intangible assets in a way that both optimizes like uh, fan engagement and fan experience, but also makes the world a better place? Well, making the world a better place is a pretty, that's a pretty big, uh, that's oh. probably beyond my pay grade. <laughs> I, I, will, I will say on the fan experience, what, what I am excited about is technology. I'm excited about the fact that maybe many of you know that a technology is being developed. I think fanatics will end up rolling it out or be involved with it, but you come to the arena and you, last time you uh, cheered for Matt Martin, number 17 on our team, and tonight as a kid or as a fan, you really want to focus on Anders Lee, number 27. You'll come into the arena, and if you've bought this uniform, the number and the name on the back will change, mm. right? So from a, from a footprint standpoint, if I want to get really technical, right, less less use of resources, right? The same uniform is being used again. The second thing in terms of the experience and technology is very much in development now, hopefully we'll be at Belmont. You walk in, you've given permission for facial recognition because privacy is super important. You walk in, you go up to a screen. Hi, Mr. Martin, how are you? Gee, I see you have little Billy and Johnny and Susan with you. Oh, is that your wife, Penelope? Hey, last time you were here, you ordered four Cokes five hot dogs and six chicken wings. Would you like the same order sent to your seat tonight or not? Or what would you like and when would you like it? And so all of a sudden, I'm talking to this screen. It's inputting my data because it has my data. I go, I sit down, and us as arena operators have to make sure that order gets there exactly when we promised it, right? That's the future of food and beverage, but that's also the future of the game. Look, bottom line, if we don't make this experience today, tomorrow, five years from now, super exciting and super special, why are you gonna get off your couch? Why are you gonna get off looking at your phone at the highlights? I've gotta give you a reason as a fan to come to the game. And that starts and ends with technology. We have to embrace technology, that's the tangible asset. We have to embrace technology to give that intangible experience that surprise and delight to the fan, right? And if we can surprise and delight the fans each and every time they come. It can't be just the screen doing it every time or the uniform changing. You, t you constantly have to think about new ways to get that fan engagement. And that's what I'm counting on your generation to do. You're the generation that's grown up with that phone in your hand with a computer. When I went to business school, there were no personal computers. So how am I going to know, I can be as, 
up on it or talk to Nicole a hundred times, but I'm not going to know what's inside your DNA. This is why this program is so damn important for professional sports leagues. We have to create a vehicle, and Columbia's done it, to get intelligent people to join our industry who get what I'm talking about, who understand that this is an entertainment industry, this is an entertainment dollar, and every time I read about Netflix competing against Disney, competing against Hulu, competing against Fox, et cetera, those are all competing for people to stay at home and nest. How do we get people to show up, get in their cars, get on a train, 30 minutes, by the way, from Grand Central and Penn Station to Belmont when we <laughs> open Express, right? But how do we get people to do that? And by the way, when they get on the train, if you guys help me, when they get on the train, what should we be doing? If it's a Bruce Springsteen concert or the Eagles or Taylor Swift, shouldn't we be playing videos and having Taylor Swift music? Shouldn't people be coming through the aisle selling Taylor Swift uh, fan gear? Shouldn't we think the minute they get in that transportation mode, the minute they get on that train, they're at Belmont Arena? The minute they get in their car, is there a way through technology? Yes, there is, through the iPhone or the Galaxy. Can we serve them original content so as they roll into the Taylor Swift concert, they've got something nobody else has who's just listening to Taylor Swift at home? And for those older people taking the grandchildren who never heard of Taylor Swift, can we create content so that they're hip when they show up and their granddaughters or nieces or nephews think, wow, they're cool. They know who Taylor Swift is. They know what the background is. They know they've that she's broken up with 16 guys or whatever the story <laughs> is, right? That's part of our responsibility as owners of an arena and owners of a sports team. Yeah. Uh, we could stay here all day. Unfortunately, we have to wrap it up. Um, John Ledecky, thank you so much thank for you taking guys. the time. Appreciate it's been a fantastic conversation.